I think that the walls between, you know, these roles are evolving in ways that seem new, but they were like back during the Library of Alexandria, you know, the museum and the library were together and the archive was the library, was the museum, and, you know, I don't know, it, you know, maybe people are reading less, as you say, Mary, but like, it's also, <clears throat> you know, there are 80 of us or something on this call right now, we're consuming media together, whatever, like while I'm talking, I'm reading stuff, I'm responding, I'm like reading from a book, I'm, you know, looking at the chat. And if we step back for a minute and just time ourselves in a given day, especially during the pandemic where we haven't been able to do a whole lot of anything, you know, the amount of just information and data that we're just piling into our brains is extraordinary. If you'd like to hold on for the next 30 seconds, you can enjoy the screen, which is actually Wikipedia updating itself as we speak live. Hello, welcome to Cambridge Forum, coming to you live via Zoom. I'm Mary Stack, the director of Cambridge Forum, and today we're continuing our transformation series, looking at the ways in which the pandemic has acted as an agent of change in our lives. Today, we're examining our severe information disorder. Well, you may say, aren't we deluged with information? Well, yes, we are, but much of it is actually untrue and useless. We all need to have access to verifiable, trustworthy information sources that are freely available. Indeed, one could argue that the future of our democracy depends upon its epistemic security, since society is reliant upon the facts in order to make well-informed decisions and to coordinate collective action in response to crises. This has been demonstrated as never before in the last year with regard to two huge global problems, one, climate change, and two, the pandemic. Yet no two random people on the street, if you polled them, would agree on the facts. Which is why it's of utter importance going forward to keep knowledge safe and uncorrupted. Whilst acknowledging that this is a huge subject for us to sink our teeth into, we're gonna have a go at it today just because it's so important. To help us understand what needs to be done, we've got the help of two fine minds in the field. Peter B. Kaufman, who's a writer, teacher, documentary producer, who works at MIT Open Learning. He's addressed many of his questions uh, in this book, his latest book, The New Enlightenment. And he's hoping that this will spark a new conversation on how we can change things. Helping advance the discourse for public media, we have Casey Davis, Kaufman, who is the Associate Director of GBH Archives and Project Manager for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. Welcome to you both. Before we begin, a quick word of thanks, gratitude to PBS for all the magnificent programs that we're the lucky recipients of. Frontline, Nova, Ken Burns, series like Eyes on the Prize and Vietnam, and also thank you to GBH Forum Network who are helping co-produce this series with us. So first, let's go to you, Peter. Um, prior to launching into present day uh, challenges, perhaps you could give us a brief overview of the fight to free knowledge historically, which is a saga of powerful forces trying to staunch the free flow of information, often with tragic consequences. Uh, we talk about William Tyndale in the book and Diderot, and then more recently, Aaron Schwartz, uh, right up to Ed Snowden, who uh, endorsed your book. So maybe you could give us a little um, back story to the present situation of today. Well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me, Mary. Thank you for organizing this great uh, event today. And um, thank you to the great Cambridge Forum and to DBH Forum Network and uh, also to the Lowell Institute, which uh, helped put us together. Um, and thanks uh, to everyone for coming. Um, yeah, I mean, I can't agree uh, with you 
more about the issue of epistemic security, which has always been, as you put it, which has always been unbelievably precarious. My book opens with this story of William Tyndall, um, who, uh, you know, uh, there's, a, there's a bunch of gruesome activity at the start of this book. People are getting uh, beheaded, disemboweled, uh, burnt at the stake, strangled to death. Um, you know, there's a, there's, a, there's a TV movie. If GBH, you know, if PBS passes on it, um, maybe Showtime. Um, but the, the, the uh, Tyndall <clears throat> had um, one goal in his life. Uh, he was an extremely devout guy. He lived in the 16th century. He died in that century. He died uh, by being burnt at the stake, um, actually being strangled and burnt at the stake uh, at the same at the same time as they did back then. And and uh, he tried to translate the Bible, <clears throat> which was, you know, a capital offense. It was uh, unbelievably uh, heretical to bring the Bible into English back then. Uh, he wanted it so that everybody could read it, um, or more importantly, back then, hear it um, <clears throat> in, the, in the common tongue. Um, but, you know, King and Crown did not want that to happen. Um, and King and Crown, you know, we, we just got through four years of, um, uh, yeah, some kind of monstrous um, king uh, we've experienced maybe uh, king and church, I mean to say, we've experienced, um, you know, uh, various challenges with organized religion, uh, suppressing truth and knowledge. But back then in the 16th century, it was um, super hard. And he, all he wanted to do was translate uh, this good book, all of it, uh, old and new, into uh, English. Uh, they chased him, Henry VIII, various popes, Thomas More chased him around Europe caught him, killed him. Um, you know, uh, the second chapter of the book is about uh, Diderot and the effort uh, in the or original uh, Enlightenment uh, through print to try to um, kind of create uh, what the great historian at Harvard, Robert Darnton, um, called maybe the most epistemic shift uh, um, um, man has experienced. Um, a, an encyclopedia full of knowledge um, that could be uh, sort of rendered available for those who could pay for it back then. Um, uh, you know, and guess what? Uh, King and church were not into that. We're not into that either. So, you know, the fates of some of these people um, who really are kind of uh, heroic. Um, trying to bring us knowledge um, has its echo uh, today in uh, the way we've seen um, others committed to bringing truthful information, verifiable information out into the public, and they've been chased into exile, uh, they've been um, cornered into suicide, they've been um, murdered uh, or imprisoned. Um, not a great scene. And then we have present day, where we've got, you know, the monstrous Googles and uh, other entities that are on the internet stopping us or making us distrust the facts. Um, before we came on air, I saw that uh, in Florida, they've just stopped some teachers teaching uh, that are vaccinated, not because they're unvaccinated. So. Um, I think protecting the integrity of information is uh, very difficult because there's such a volume of stuff coming at us. Uh, who's currently doing a good job of sifting the wheat in the chaff? Well, um, um, you know, obviously hats off to public broadcasting. And I know um, Casey will say much more about this um, from its earliest days to now. Um, uh, just one of the great heroic institutions of our time in any uh, country, uh, you know, our, our public broadcasting system. So thanks, um, viewers like you. Uh, but, uh, you know, I, this book is a kind of um, tribute to Wikipedia, tribute to the Internet Archive, 
tribute to activist organizations. A, a full third of the book is kind of a, you know, what to do now about this issue. Because it, you know, as your intro pointed out, yes, it's affecting all of us. Uh, there's a global pandemic raging parts of the world, India, Brazil, that, um, you know, are, are facing these surges are facing them in part because um, people are lying about science and health uh, uh, left and right. But, you know, uh, there's climate change, uh, you mentioned, there's the political violence that we have here that we witnessed, you know, in January, there's the economic crises that we're facing. A lot of this is just is just a function of, as they say, apparently in algebra, you know, a function of um, uh, bad information. So the thing that started us off at the beginning of this um, hour is a, a live sort of a, a visual representation of Wikipedia being edited. Um, Wikipedia is the successor institution to the encyclopedia of the original enlightenment. It is this global encyclopedia, the most popular non-commercial website in the world. One of the most popular websites, fifth, sixth, 10th, depending on how you um, count it on a given day in the world, commercial or non-commercial. And the core of Wikipedia, just as the core of the original encyclopedia in the enlightenment is verification. So you have to be able whatever you post there to have a source for it. Um, this is not interpretive, uh, interpretative uh, material, uh, or if it is and you post it there, it won't stay up uh, for long. It's always in progress as that video and musical um, representation demonstrates. And, and uh, Wikipedia to your, to your, you know, to answer your question is, I think primus inter pares in, in bringing us a universe where we have verified information. But the Internet Archive is another extraordinary place. And archives generally, universities, museums, libraries, broadcasters that are public, and archives, and then, you know, double, triple it, you've got the American Archive, which is public broadcasting, an archive, a library, all together. These are the places that we have to draw some lessons from how they operate and how they verify information. So um, this brings us to the question of kind of gatekeepers. Um, somebody is monitoring the content at Wikipedia, one presumes, um, because you're saying it has to be posted with verifiable information. So I don't know the inner workings, but I presume someone is checking the veracity of that information. Um, because I think the question of that the internet is not a publisher it is a tricky one because it actually is a publisher. Uh, you know, when newspapers were set up, you know, there was all the libel laws and you had a kind of structure, a regulatory structure, so that things had to be verifiable or you sued the person for defamation. Right. Uh, the internet is kind of this sort of a wild west scenario where I can say anything about you and then if you start getting upset and wanting it to be taken down I can say oh well I was just expressing an opinion and you know it's it's just whatever citizen journalism so we're in this tricky situation aren't we one has to have gatekeepers of some kind surely although some people say that that's antithetical to free speech yeah I mean I think there are a lot of I think there are a lot of answers to that. Um, it's a great question. I, you know, the thing about Wikipedia is that anybody can edit it. You know, um, it is our sort of community resource. It's a public, in effect, resource, um, a non-commercial. Um, obviously, there's some great um, there's some great experiences we've had where. Uh, you know, well-financed uh, um, media organizations have managed to publish verifiable information in such a way as to kind of change, also provide, like the original encyclopedia and Robert Darnton's words, you know, like an epistemic shift, epistemological shift that changed the nature of human history and, you know, 
the Pentagon Papers, for example, or um, you know, and Daniel Ellsberg, for example, mm -hmm. is speaking with Ed Snowden this this Friday <clears throat> at a at a UMass Friday and Saturday at a UMass event. Um, Definitely worth. Uh, do you have lot. any details about that piece? I, I do. I can find it um, yeah, but when I'm not when I'm right. not talking. I can, <laughs> I can find it and put it in the chat. That would be you very know. handy for anyone yeah. wanting to do that. It's an extraordinary thing, and you know, also, uh, I don't know. Great books on climate change have been serialized, for example, in the New Yorker, and you know, um, but in the end, it's like uh, we're only as good as who controls us. And uh, if we're controlling our own modes of communication, I think we're a little stronger. So that's why, you know, hats off to public media, which is not owned by shareholders. It's not, um, it's not governed by some kind of curious Sanhedrin that goes down to the Caribbean, I think, and you maybe, I don't know, you guys. Um, but, uh, you know, periodically, I, I think it's, um, it's our network. And I think we have to figure out ways of making sure the way we publish information, um, whether it's video, which a big part of my book is basically, you know, we have to focus on, that's the new enlightenment. It's audiovisual stuff. It's like how we're communicating right now. Yeah. Uh, thank you, Annie. That's, that's the link in the chat. Thank you. Um, well, since we've talked about public broadcasting, um, and we're going to move over to Casey before we talk about how important libraries are. Um, Casey, you're in the business of kind of making history in the sense of recording and selecting what gets saved. So apart from this being a huge responsibility, as we're now reevaluating all sorts of perspectives in terms of our own national history, what is the role of an archivist in fighting against fake news and reinforcing context? How do you Thank you, Mary. Um, hi, everyone. Uh, great to be here. Um, my name is Casey Davis Kaufman. Uh, as Mary mentioned earlier, I, I'm, I work at WGBH. Um, I've been there for about 10 years, uh, now the Associate Director of the GBH Archives, and uh, manage a project with the Library of Congress called the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. And for eight years now, we have been uh, working with public media stations across the country to uh, help them digitize their, their material that they have recorded, uh, the, the programming that they've created over the last 60, 70 plus years um, throughout the history of the public broadcasting system in the US and preserve that material at the Library of Congress and make it publicly available to the public. Um, just thinking about the history of public broadcasting and some of those lofty goals Lyndon Johnson, when he uh, signed the Public Broadcasting Act, one a quote from, from his commentary that day, we must consider new ways to build a great network for knowledge, not just a broadcast system, but one that employs every means of sending and storing information that the individual can use. So not just sending information, but storing that information that the individual can use. Um, the Public Broadcasting Act, when it was signed, created the Corporation for Public Broadcasting and within their mandate, authorize CPB to establish and maintain a library and archives of public media. So that mission to preserve and, and, and manage and make available the content created by public broadcasting stations from the very beginning was recognized that the programming that's being produced is evergreen and it has a long uh, potential use to help not only educate and inspire and enlighten people when it's broadcast, but as a historical record. And we're now at the point, uh, we have over, if you count uh, community radio and TV across the country, we've got over 1300 public television and radio stations and licensees uh, that have for 50, 60, 70 years been really on the front lines of their community documenting on video and, and audio uh, the, the, what's going on in their community, the history, the for people, the perspectives uh, um, of, of what's happened in that community. So as an archivist, as someone you know responsible for protecting the integrity of information, um, you know, Peter says this so well in his book that cultural heritage institutions should be publishing their the material that has been stored in, in, in vaults for years. And that's what we have been doing. Um, audio, magnetic media has a short lifespan uh, and it has been for 
for decades been really the, the driving medium of the cultural record of our time. Uh, and making that material available now is imperative uh, before it is lost. Uh, magnetic media, as I said, uh, depending on the format can have a lifespan of 10, 15 years. Some formats like DAT tapes, which were pretty common in the 90s for recording radio, uh, we've seen audio dropouts in only five to seven years. So we learn from our past and uh, you know the history that's written that is written is going to be based on the sources that scholars and and, and what others have access to. Um, and so we as cultural heritage professionals need to be making as much of that material available online as possible, freely available for people to access. Um, and we also need to ensure that the records of the past are reflective of the multitude of voices that are present within our historic record. Um, archives have been considered for a very long time as objectively collecting and preserving history as neutral third parties. Uh, and there has been a trust in archivists as stewards of our collective history and as trusted sources of evidence. But we are you know, reckoning with the fact that um, with you know within the last 10 or so years and especially over the last year as the um the calls for um for um addressing injustices long-standing injustices facing black indigenous and other people of color are being amplified we're reckoning with the fact that um the actual process of selecting and preserving and describing archival records in itself is subjective and it has for many years tended to skew towards the prioritization of documenting history from the top down white narratives where um, people of color have been marginalized from that record. Um, there are movements now in our field to decolonize, to reinterpret our collections, to prioritize the preservation of collections documenting underrepresented communities and to rethink how we describe those materials, uh, ensuring that the language we use in our metadata uh, the information about the material we're making available is inclusive and represents the, the communities and voices in the way that they would want to be shared. Um, I'll also add that there is also recognition when our, within our field that in order to truly evolve our practice uh, and ensure equity in the preservation of our history, that our field needs to be reflective of our population. Uh, the ar archival field has been primarily white for a long time. Uh, and we're now reckoning with the fact that we need stewards uh, from the communities that are documented within our collections in order to sure, ensure that we're preserving them and making them available in ways that are in alignment with those communities. I just, in, in fairness, Mary, I, you know, because Casey said a couple nice things about this book that I've, like, I have to say, and I would say it anyway, 100 Ways to Sunday, that, that, uh, American archive is like one of the most important things that we've got going. Um, and it's just an unbelievable resource from its conception to its execution, uh, to its future planning. Um, I've been able to, you know, attend some of these meetings. Um, um, but like, you know, the Eyes on the Prize series, um, which is kind of a landmark maybe one of the, no doubt, one of the greatest civil rights, um, one of the greatest historical pieces of work um, that has been published in any medium, uh, produced in, in any medium in the United States. Um, the full transcripts of those interviews, uh, including interviews that relate directly to, you know, films we've been watching recently and <laughs> to put it mildly, issues that we've been experiencing as citizens are, are online now for anybody to go through. Um, and it's just, a, it's just an unbelievably essential gesture. I, I, one thing I want to add, Casey, to what you said is, you know, you're quoting Lyndon Johnson um, at this dedication ceremony in, in 1967. And he also said to be like, um, you know, I don't know what fully um, fully uh, kind of promotion oriented at the moment. He also said, you know, that the system he was signing into law will be free and it will be independent and it will belong to all of our people. And he said, we rededicate a part of the airwaves, rededicate, which is an interesting kind of concept. Like he was noticing, and Bill Moyers, who wrote some of this, was noticing, and a whole lot of other people, 
had noticed, like Newton Minow and others under Kennedy, that the television had gotten away from us, in some sense, similar to the internet. Uh, today, um, we rededicate a part of the airwaves, which belong to all the people, and we dedicate them for the enlightenment of all the people. And part of the reason why this book, you know, carries this um, title is because it turns out like at various times um, in, you know, the history of the 19th, 20th, 21st century, the enlightenment concept has come and come around again. Um, and so I'm, I'm advocating for us to think ambitiously once more about what we're facing. Well, on, on that note, um, Katie, I have to say I really enjoyed and continuing to enjoy the alternative uh, independent uh, films that are available, it seems, round the clock on there's a world uh, PBS channel that I mm -hmm. watched constantly and that the, the versions of history you hear because it's, it's people's oral histories explaining things is, is riveting. I've learned a tremendous about um, about American history from that, being as I'm not, a, you know, I'm not a native. In case anyone missed that. <laughs> um, so uh, I think this is a great resource, and it makes it riveting, because I'm going to move now to another topic, which is the role of libraries. Because uh, I was amazed. Um, I was researching Aaron Schwartz um, that his big crime was trying to liberate, now albeit illegally information from MIT's uh, database, correct, Peter? Um, it was information through a connection at MIT, but uh, from a database of a nonprofit um, that provides access on a paid basis to um, scholarly journals. So, um, so yeah. he didn't go about it quite the right way, but I think the intent was, was a great, idea, you know, that he, he was way ahead of his time in that regard. Um, so how important are libraries still? Because I'm really of the view that people are reading less and less. Um, and how has their function evolved to kind of keep up with technology? Mm -hmm. Maybe you could have a bite at that, Casey, and, and then Peter, you. Yeah, well, uh, the fight against fake news and uh, Misinformation has, is, one, is, is one that libraries and archives have been working to address for many, many years. Uh, we're just dealing with it in new mediums now with, with moving images. We're thinking about, uh, you know, how do we deal with deep fakes with, uh, you mm -hmm. know, the ability, the technical ability for someone to put someone's face on another person's body and, and, and for that, you know, sort of propaganda to be utilized as a way to communicate misinformation. So we're now just dealing with it in new ways. Um, you know, libraries are, the mission of the, them has been to just provide unfettered access to information. Um, but with regard to the fake, with, you know, the fight against fake news and information, because of libraries unique situation within communities as partners, as educators, um, as champions of knowledge, um, they have an opportunity and they have been uh, teaching information and media literacy. So within uh, like the Association for College and Research Libraries, there are standards for information literacy that academic librarians have deployed uh, within their, within the um, ac uh, academic situations that they're, that they're working in and uh, within public libraries and academic libraries, information literacy has been core, teaching people how to um, evaluate information, look at sources, evaluate the credibility of sources, determine you know, what is the chain of custody of this information, and then how do I go about making a good decision based on the sources that are provided. Um, and in academic libraries, there have been movements to encourage open access publishing. Um, Peter can talk all about that. Um, but you know, encouraging Creative Commons licensing. Creative Commons is a nonprofit whose mission is to encourage open access to cultural heritage material or other created works. Uh, it provides six licenses for people, for, for creators to assign to their works to uh, communicate from the onset of publishing that they're okay with other people making use of their uh, of their of their work in in specific ways. Um, 
So communicating the value of open access, even creating journals that are housed within the library that they can use as an alternative that they can um, that scholars and students can publish in as an alternative to the you know really five or six major publishing companies that are going to lock away their their scholarship and require people to have to pay a license fee in order to access it. So Peter. No, I, you know, I, I second everything mm -hmm. there. I think, I think that the walls between, you know, these roles are evolving in ways that seem new, but they were like back during the library of Alexandria, you know, the museum and the library were together and the archive was the library was the museum. And, you know, I don't know, it, you know, maybe people are reading less as you say, Mary, but like, it's also, <clears throat> you know, there are 80 of us or something on this call right now, we're consuming media together, whatever. Like while I'm talking, I'm reading stuff, I'm responding, I'm like reading from a book, I'm you know, looking at the chat. And if we step back for a minute and just time ourselves in a given day, especially during the pandemic where we haven't been able to do a whole lot of anything, you know, the amount of just, information and data that we're just piling into our brains is extraordinary. And it's precisely like, it's not an accident that the Library of Congress is a partner in the American archive because, you know, um, of all the things that the Library of Congress can do and of all the reasons why the Library of Congress was set up by the way, uh, by, you know, an enlightenment character like, Thomas Jefferson. So um, I can't say like Brewster Kale, who's another just incredibly, you know, visionary uh, character who's the founder and runs the Internet Archive, calls himself a kind of a librarian, even though he's the head of something called the Archive. Um, so I think all of these things are kind of blending together a little bit. Their roles are kind of, you know, there's some porous quality to them, but they're all in the business as Casey has been just listing all the different roles that people are playing. Um, and increasingly, I think it's gonna be important for media such as this. We may be reading less, but does that discount? Like, does that make this experience? I hope not, by the way. Although, yeah, it's essential. Um, but um, yeah, <laughs> but like, does that, does that make this experience any like second, best because we're getting together to talk about it rather than to read about it no and I, I think you know if you look at the trump era the record of that is going to be audiovisual. uh it's inescapable uh social media too and all of that so these are roles the science of information is um the archive the library these are the seats the seats of knowledge and therefore the seats of power uh, in, in, the, in, the, in the coming uh, decades and centuries. Um, somebody, two people have actually jumped in. Uh, Marcos has said, isn't the key word for trustworthy gatekeepers accountability? I'm all for gatekeepers as long as they explain what they're doing openly, but internal secret algorithms from private companies such as Facebook are what gets us into trouble. Yeah, Marcos, you know, hello. Thank you for that question. Great that you joined this thing. Like, um, totally. And that's part of the reason why on Wikipedia, there's incredible transparency. People don't, there's a lot to criticize Wikipedia for. It's celebrating its 20th anniversary, as is, uh, by the way, MIT Open Courseware, mm. um, as is Creative Commons, which is mentioned. Uh, my colleague at MIT, Kurt Newton, asked this question, like, what was in the water in 2001 that all these, all these, or 2000, that all these, organ, 2001, that all these organizations are, um, uh, you know, established in that year. Um, but yeah, accountability is essential. And that's why the original NCPD that these guys put together insisted on, you um, um, yeah, accountability for all the articles. There were codes set up for how to identify the authors. There were 
27,000 intertextual links, if you can imagine, um, between articles. Um, and I think <laughs> Wikipedia has inherited that mantle. Uh, it, is the, it is the core to cross-referencing, uh, and it's likely to be the core to audiovisual. I mean, how do you footnote, you know, Marcos, back to you? Like, how do you, how do you footnote a podcast? How, how do you make a footnote in a podcast? How do you, how do you create citations um, for Casey? You know, if if if, if uh, Eyes on the Prize were being produced today, you know these sources and what have you are usually rolling at the end. You know, you have credit. a transcript too. Yeah, right? yeah, but, yeah, but like, yeah. there's no reason if we're watching it on you know machines like we're all using right now, why we can't, you know just do the equivalent of what we're doing in chat. I mentioned something, you know, all of a sudden a link pops up to it. Like we should be able to get there with audiovisual materials to make sure that people like, uh, you know, Trump and his cabinet of demons can't reimpose some just, you know, shroud of lies on us. And, and you know, we're, we can't penetrate it because we can't see where those falsehoods are really originating. So that's an essential technological and media challenge. Um, and thank God, you know, I work at MIT where everybody figures all that stuff out. Okay, so we've got a couple of very interesting quotes coming in here, um, comments. Uh, Shannon shared a quote from Michael Crichton, quote, the irony of the information age is that it has given new respectability to uninformed opinion which I would totally endorse that. I remember reading a book on that topic um, when the new citizen journalist first hit the internet and everybody was you know, blogging from everywhere. And somebody who started off being a great supporter of that ended up being highly skeptical of it saying, real journalists job, their job is on the line if they get something wrong. So there's actually the onus is on them to get it correct and verifiable. Whereas if I'm just blogging away in my attic, I can just say anything about anything. So I think that's a very good point. Also, um, this brings us to a, Elizabeth Seeger has just come in and I was about to actually mention her work. Um, I read an article that she had done on BBC Futures about epistemic security. She works at Cambridge and she researches the future of intelligence. And she said in this article, it's becoming increasingly difficult to make sure everyone is well informed. Being well informed is often a privilege of time and resources that most people cannot easily afford. In the competition for eyeballs, the most effective attention grabbers appeal to people's emotions and existing beliefs. The resulting erosion of trust has led to the creation of a degraded information ecosystem, which has created a threat to global security. So this is how important this issue is. Um, I think she raises an, a very important point. Um, if you start off with small lies, you just keep building on them. And we all know the consequences of that. Um, so, uh, I think it's ever so important that people think about what sources they're going to for their information, uh, which br brings me to this other point, which I, I don't want to play devil's advocate because of course I use my phone for checking things. But I think what worries me a little bit is people are replacing real knowledge with soundbite kind of things, which are very ephem ephemeral. Uh, people don't remember things when they, they have a bite. They do remember something if they've read it. And I think it, it, I think that context is very important. When you read something in a book, it's in a context. When you get a clip or a sound bite, it's just bing. Um, so I don't know what I'm asking there. Would you agree with that, Casey? Yeah, I, I read somewhere that uh, six out of 10 people who share a link on Facebook don't actually even click the and to read the article before they share it. Uh, so yeah, it is a pervasive wow. issue. Um, mm -hmm. I think, you know, ac having access to these tiny computers I also has its benefits though. Um, you know, a lot of many low income people, you know, the smartphones are really the only way that they right. can get access yeah. to the internet and um, have access online. Um, but 
I, I checked our Google Analytics recently, and about 38% of people who come to our archive website are on a, are on a smartphone. Um, so even if people are, you know, scrolling, constantly scrolling on their, you know, on their phones, they're also taking the time to, to build their knowledge, to come to, our, to an archive and spend time there on a phone. Um, but in general, I think that, yes, the, the soundbite issue is one. I really love Peter's idea that he mentioned earlier of uh, having the source right alongside the, the, the image or the, or the soundbite. Uh, if you're watching a program, I think that that's a way of the future that could help address mm -hmm. putting the source right there in front of people um, before they did with, you know, giving them the option to select it or not. All right, listening to the baseball game while you're watching it on the telly, muted. <laughs> that was a bad, bad comparison. Elizabeth Seeger actually just typed in a, a comment. She says, we're currently experiencing a decline in public trust in even public media sources. This is largely due to a decline in trust in institutions more generally. What are your thoughts on how we might regain public trust in reliable information sources? Is it ab more about educating the public? So Peter, do you want to take that? Yeah, I mean, this is a great question. And I don't know, I wonder if Elizabeth Seeger would agree or not, but um, I mean, this is a, this is a multi-generational challenge, you know, um, building trust in institutions, because in part, that trust has been degrading, um, degraded uh, over generations, you know, that's part of what public broadcasting was, the, the founders of public broadcasting were reacting to in uh, the mid 1960s, but, you know, broadcast radio and television um, had gotten to a point over, yeah, some decades. Um, if you count in radio, if you um, include visual education media like cinema and films in the classroom and in churches and what have you, which my book goes on ad, na ad nauseum about, I think, you know, you're talking about half a century. Um, so I think it's going to take a long time to build back that trust. But I think um, while we do so, and while we try to regain, I don't know, some hold of the reins over, you know, how to regulate media that's gone out of control, super hard to do with politicians bought and sold left and right in state houses and in the Capitol. Um, we have to rededicate ourselves to use Johnson's language. Um, I don't quote Lyndon Johnson a lot, but you know, um, to, to ourselves as uh, universities and archives and uh, public broadcasters and others to get this material out online um, and to do so in a way where the chain of authority, the, um, Casey, your phrase, like um, what librarians are helping us sort through our evidence so that we know that, you know, a published statement is a verifiable uh, statement. At whatever medium it's in, those could be words, that could be a clip from this um, event today in, in uh, you know, a video. Um, it's part of the challenge for all of us. Uh, open courseware uh, at MIT, which, um, you know, is huge. YouTube's, its YouTube channel has 3 million subscribers. Um, I think it's the largest educational institution broadcaster in effect or telecaster or on, the, on, the, on the web um, needs to sort through. How do you, you know, the fact that an MIT professor may be saying, you know, uh, something about a, uh, a linear algebra uh, may not be enough for somebody or more specifically, I guess, or more Relatedly, uh, the fact that a professor at any institution can be saying something about race relations or uh, the, the vote um, may not be enough. And we have to make sure that there's a 
you know, that it's more than turtles all the way down. Um, someone has written in, Martin, Twitter now asks me, would you like to read the article first before forwarding it? Uh, very helpful. Uh, Peter has also made his book available through Open Culture, and we've posted the link to that. Thank you, Peter, for that. Martin asks, uh, I remember in a This American Life story where a protagonist thought that the BBC and Breitbart were reputable sources representing left and conservative sides. What does this tell us about the basic uncomprehension among the public? I mean, I'd love to tackle that one, if that's okay. Um, I, you know, uh, there are 60% of Americans who believe in angels. Um, 40 to 50% of us did, uh, don't fully believe in evolution. So to the generational point, you know, um, you're not born, uh, <laughs> you're not born believing in angels. You're not born believing in Breitbart. You're not born believing in, you know, uh, man's sudden appearance on, on earth the way he is today um, at the, at the, on the first day. So you're taught this stuff and you have to be what's the word, taught other stuff, I guess, or given verifiable alternatives. And now the web, you know, we're all competing for space on this rectangle right now. This is the, or the phone, whatever, like it's incredible. And, and the, uh, you know, we're failing. We, as in whatever we are, like universities and others, um, uh, you know, if, 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 we're failing, we're failing to recognize this as a challenge as great as COVID, uh, you know? And, and that's, why, that's why I wrote this book. Um, and I hope that, uh, you know, the, the knowledge institutions um, that, are, that are out there that can affect change and that can commit to, you know, public broadcasting was also not intended to you know, generate an informed, educated viewer base within a year. Uh, that was a multi-generational project as we're experiencing now. Maybe even it's Apogee is the uh, American archive where you can sort through all this material uh, and who knows how searchable and, you know, how many nuggets it will generate in the future, how they can be appended to open courses, for example, or, you know, other online material, newspaper article. All of that is ahead of us. And so... It's a heck of a time. Two, two more comments over here. Anne says, free speech is free. How do we keep that even if we don't agree with the point of view? That's one thing. Then Emily is asking Casey a question after that. Does anybody want to go after the free speech? That's a big question there. That's a difficult one because it calls into the whole thing of censorship and when is an opinion an unfact? <laughs> um, should there be something written, a kind of a rider underneath it saying this is a point of view, not a fact? Um, that's, that's a tricky one. Yeah. I mean, I don't know. Uh, it's a great topic. Um, the very first talk that I gave it, it, for this book um, was at a law school. And, you know, this like five star professor of law asked me, you know, as the first question. So should we rewrite the First Amendment? You know, and I'm like, you're, you're, you're the, uh, you're the law, you know, you're the constitutional scholar here. But uh, I just think rather than imposing limits on people right away, which is our, it's sometimes our natural tendencies, we need to accelerate our effort to get verifiable information out mm. there. Mm. Um, and that's where our focus needs to be because it's super hard to control people. Um, as any parent knows, and and um, um, it's also um, it's also um, super hard to have faith in legislative judicial regulations of the sort that we need when um, the system is uh, currently so uh, corrupted. I agree with you, Peter. That. Uh... 
in the meantime, what we need to be doing is give people the tools to be able to document what they're experiencing. Um, there's work within the archival field, specifically folks at Witness. Um, Yvonne Ng is an archivist there who created an activist guide to archiving media, uh, giving people the tools that they need to understand how to record human rights abuses, uh, preserve them and make them available to, for use as video evidence of, of injustices that people are experiencing all over the world. And maybe with more facts, more documentation, more video documentation, we will be able to better uh, counter those false narratives. Um, somebody's asked you a question. Part of what makes an archive or library useful is the ability to search and find specific information. How do you tackle the enormous amount of metadata and transcription necessary to make audiovisual archive as searchable as possible? It's another big question. <laughs> yeah, and that goes back to, you know, what is the role of the archivist in fighting fake news and and one of our roles has been provenance and provenance is again that you know the chain of custody communicating the context of what we're presenting and preserving and being transparent about our practices and doing and doing so um, metadata is a huge challenge when you're thinking about audiovisual materials um, you know traditional archival practice for print materials is you create a finding aid that kind of provide some context on a collection. And a collection could be boxes and boxes of paper documents. But for audiovisual materials, as we're digitizing them, each specific item can contain millions of frames in itself. Um, so how do you create metadata about, the, about such a vast collection that can be made searchable for people to be able to access in the means that they're looking for information, and that being search engines, that being Wikipedia? Um, so metadata is very time uh, uh, time consuming and with limited resources with archives it is always a challenge. But there have been um, you know opportunities for looking at artificial intelligence, uh, speech to text tools, speech to text being being able to run an audio file through a machine and create a transcript from it. Uh, all of that work also results in bias in the output from these artificial intelligence tools because uh, the tools themselves are trained on specific subsets of data um, that represent a specific subset of the population. Uh, we've been creating transcripts about uh, for the materials in our collection using an open source tool called Caldi. Um, and it was trained on Wall Street Journal articles. So if you think about the output of, uh, you know, of what we're generating from such a vast collection that represents many different accents, vernacular, speech patterns from all over the country, um, it is very much a challenge. But there are also, um, you know, we're working with Brandeis uh, University right now, uh, their lab for computational linguistics to uh, explore what tools we could use that are in the public domain or open source that we could uh, apply to our collection to create metadata. Um, one example is just uh, being able to detect text on a screen uh, when you're uh, and run, run files through uh, the machine to be able to identify these are the opening credits. This is the slate that appears at the beginning of the program. These are the talking heads. This is the lower third information. Uh, and being able to uh, programmatically render that information and store it and make it available. There's still a long way to go with using artificial intelligence for archival material and for audiovisual material at large, but it is an area that we're exploring and I think has potential. A uh, couple of things here. Shannon writes quite a depressing point, which is a good one though. Why bother ferreting out information? Now it's gone off my screen. Why bother to ferret out sources of misinformation if a substantial portion of the population doesn't seem to care if any given statement is actually true? Wow, that's rather depressing. I think she's right there. Um, um, okay, I, I'm going to throw out one to both of you here. Are you guys optimistic that we can wrestle back control of this kind of monster? Is good information something we should be willing to pay for? I myself do and think it is, uh, even if it's donating to public television and public radio. If not, how do we ensure the World Wide Web becomes a free universal encyclopedia? 
So they're the two options. Either we really fund the World Wide Web and we create gate posts and, and good methods of, of, of veracity of checking, or we might have to resort and or to paying for the information. Like we know the economist, every single fact in the economist is triple checked. I don't know any other publication that does that, but that's okay. really good to know when you read something, it's been triple checked. So um, I don't know. I have some issues with stuff I've read in The Economist uh, that oh. I would bring up. So I, I would, I would, if you went, when you do another hour on that. But um, I would say, uh, you know, there's a lot of questions you packed in at, there. Uh, but like optimism, part of the reason why um, I, I, you know, wrote this book also was to profile people who've been exceedingly brave, and sometimes you know sacrificed a whole lot in order to follow <clears throat> down some of the paths we're talking about um, today. Uh, so I would say I'm optimistic if, if the institutions that we all work at can be brave or if we can help them be brave. When a, when a university president is silent during three years, four years of Trump, that serves nobody. Forgive me for those people you know, who vote for Trump who are on this, whatever, that's a whole other I'm using that as my personal example and whatever. Um, I think, you know, when a museum is silent, frankly, about this kind of stuff, museums are, I work for Sanjay Sarma at, at MIT, the vice president for open learning. He has this phrase about us creating a ziggurat, a temple of facts, you know, and museums are temples of facts. Um, uh, there's a whole lot of colonial stuff that we also need to unpack there as in public broadcasting, as in archiving, what have you. But, you know, we need these institutions and the people who run them to be a lot braver in the face of challenges that are mortal challenges. Like, I cannot underscore that enough. These four years that we've just come out of have presented mortal, there are 500,000 people dead in America, there are millions all over, you know, who've, who've essentially um, succumbed both to a virus and to misinformation one way or another. And that's, that's a shameful situation. So we can't let that happen again. And I hope that, you know, I will be as optimistic as, as, as you know, as long as all of us can be brave about it. So Casey, so, um... Trump defied custom in that he didn't give the National Archives records of his speeches at political rallies. So here we have another challenge for the archivist, the invisible president. Yeah. So. Uh, I think there are records out there that archivists are gonna get their hands on at some point. Uh, we, we're gonna do our due diligence on that one. That's a, uh, that's a very optimistic ending. So that, that's what we're encouraging everyone to do. Support their public media, go to their libraries, be brave. Any more words of advice? Keep reading. And we're gonna mention Peter's book, which is The New Enlightenment. There it is and the fight to free knowledge. Very interesting, uh, historically very interesting as well as looking forward. A lot of resources in there too. There's a Dutch resource you mentioned. Um, what's the Dutch resource, Peter? Uh, sound, sound and vision? Yeah, sound and vision. Mm -hmm. um, so unfortunately, is there any parting notes you want to say before we close? I know we, there are lots of things we didn't get to, but we did cover quite a lot. You made a good attempt. Okay, so you, you wanna? Uh, just one other resource I wanted to share is the Environmental Data and Governments Initiative, which kind of goes back to uh, Mary's comment about 
uh, Trump not, not handing over his speeches. Um, their archivists are already doing this work. We're, uh, during the Trump and, um, administration, you know, information about climate change was disappearing from government websites and archivists captured that information and it is being preserved. So I wanted to put that uh, resource out. Um, but I'm always inspired when I go to our annual Association of Moving Image Archivist Conference. There are thousands of us who are doing this work. Uh, that's just moving image preservation professionals, but I'm inspired by all the colleagues that are within the cultural heritage community. And uh, I, it makes me optimistic uh, for our future. And yeah. we ourselves are actually um, digitizing all our old programs, which is a big task. We've got hundreds and hundreds of them um, to preserve their life. Also good frame of reference, like on civil rights to see what was said 20 years ago, 50 years ago, fascinating. Well, um, I thoroughly enjoyed our conversation today. I think uh, we also had lots of good questions. Uh, we didn't get to all of them. Um, yeah, uh, I um, think there's a lot to learn. I'd say get, get hold of Peter's book. Um, so thanks for listening today to Cambridge Forum's discussion of severe information disorder with Peter Kaufman from MIT's Open Learning, author of The New Enlightenment, Casey Davis Kaufman, Associate Director of GBH Archives, Project Manager for the American Archive of Public Broadcasting. So nothing more for me to add except thank you all for joining us. I hope you, you learned something. Um, I certainly did. Thank you to our great guests, Peter Kaufman and Casey, uh, for making the time and see you next time. Thank you. <laughs>